For more physics related videos, please subscribe. Welcome to Stellar Physics 5e. In this video, I'm going to go over the CNO cycle, which is one of the mechanisms that converts hydrogen into helium that takes place in stellar cores. I rated the physics level in this video as intermediate. Before we get to the CNO cycle, in the previous video, Stellar Physics 5d, I went over the other mechanism that fuses hydrogen into helium, called the proton proton chain. This chain has three main branches. The green is the first branch, the orange is the second branch, and the yellow is the third branch. There's also a fourth branch in white, but its rate is significantly less than the other three branches, so it's generally ignored. In fact, there are even more branches you could come up with, but their production rate is even lower, so generally we can safely ignore everything except for the three main branches. In Stellar Physics 5D, we also set up a set of differential equations to describe the full proton-proton chain, and we're going to do a similar thing in this video for the CNO cycle. As you can see, this is a pretty complicated set of differential equations, but we are able to simplify it by assuming that all of the intermediary species between hydrogen and helium we're in what's called statistical equilibrium. And all it means is that the rate of change of the number of species is zero. So the rate at which a nuclear species is being created is equal to the rate at which it's being destroyed. And when we did this, this set of equations simplified to a set of two differential equations, which is actually solvable analytically. To set up these equations, we use this expression for the nuclear rate of a given species x, which I derived in stellar physics 5c. So what this says is the time rate of change of a species x, which I'm defining as x dot, is equal to some rate lambda, which in general is highly temperature dependent, times the product of the parent species. So x1 and x2 are the two nuclei that come together for a given nuclear reaction. Lambda will differ for every nuclear reaction. Okay, so now let's move on to the other mechanism for fusing hydrogen, which is called the CNO cycle which stands for carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen cycle. So the basic idea here is that various carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen isotopes act as catalysts for hydrogen fusion. And as you can see on this diagram, the CNO cycle is made up of a number of subcycles. Not only that, we've broken up the CNO cycle into two CNO cycles. The cold cycle, represented by the black arrows, and the hot cycle, represented by the purple arrows. So, the cold cycle will take place at temperatures less than T9 of 0.2, where T9 means the temperature in units of 10 to the 9 Kelvin, so a billion Kelvin. The hot CNO cycle takes place at temperatures between T9 of 0.2 and 0.5. Now, let me clarify here. It's not that if you get to a T9 of 0.2, the cold CNO cycle shuts off and the hot one turns on. Both of them are going on simultaneously. When we say the hot CNO cycle takes over at a T9 of 0.2, what we mean is that above that temperature, it will put out more energy than the cold CNO cycle. So it will be the dominant form of hydrogen fusion. In this diagram, there's also what's called the RP process in this goldish brownish color. This is a separate process altogether. RP process stands for rapid proton process. And basically what happens is, if you get to a temperature sufficiently high, T9 of 0.5, then the protons are moving around so fast that the dominant form of energy production is just protons being captured on a bunch of different nuclei. So the lingo that's typically used is that at a sufficiently high temperature, you break out from the CNO cycle into the RP process. But we're not going to discuss the RP process in this video. So before we get into the details of this diagram, let's first discuss the conditions for the CNO cycle to take place. The first condition is the CNO cycle requires a slightly higher temperature than the proton-proton chain. So colder stars will burn on the proton-proton chain and hotter stars will burn on the CNO cycle. And again, when I say one or the other, both the proton-proton chain and the CNO cycle will happen simultaneously, but if we say it's burning on, say, the CNO cycle, it just means the CNO cycle is the dominant form of energy output. And similarly, if we say it's burning on the proton-proton chain, the proton-proton chain is putting out more energy than the CNO cycle. So because, generally speaking, more massive stars require a higher temperature, higher mass stars will burn on the CNO cycle, and lower mass stars on the proton-proton chain. Roughly speaking, to be burning on the CNO cycle, you need a mass of about 1.5 solar masses or higher. 
So the sun is burning on the proton-proton chain. Even though the CNO cycle is still occurring inside the sun, the dominant form of energy production is the proton-proton chain. The next condition, which is a fairly obvious one, is you need to have carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen around in order for the CNO cycle to take place. Now, the only stars really that don't have carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen in them are what are called POP3 stars, which are the first stars ever created in the universe. And that's because they're made up of what's called primordial abundances. They're made up of whatever was around before the first stars were created. And that's hydrogen, helium, and a tiny bit of lithium. Everything else is made inside of stars, or as a result of stellar collapse in one way or another. Now, when I say you need carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen around, you don't need a lot. All stars, whether they're POP3 or not, are made up of almost entirely hydrogen and helium. If they do have heavier elements, all of the heavier elements combined make up less than 1% of the star's makeup. So like I said, you only need a tiny bit of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen around, but you can't have zero. And that is the case for POP3 stars. Even though POP3 stars, which have never actually been observed, are theorized to have been extremely massive, somewhere between 100 and 1,000 solar masses, which means they must have been very hot. But because they don't have any CNO catalysts inside them, they have to burn on the proton-proton chain, at least initially. Eventually, they will create some carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, at which point they will switch over to the CNO cycle. All right, now let's get into the details of this diagram. How are we supposed to read this? Let's take a look at one of these reactions. Let's look at carbon-12 converts into nitrogen-13. You can see here we have the details of a reaction in parentheses, and the way you read this is, the first species is what's being captured, and the second is what's being emitted. So in this particular case, we're capturing a proton and emitting a gamma, which is a photon. And this 2 MeV here is the average energy released by the gamma ray, by the photon. So just to recap, this is saying carbon-12 is going to capture a proton, and emit a photon, which on average will have an energy of 2 mega electron volts. And this will convert the carbon-12 into a nitrogen-13 nucleus. If you're finding this video interesting so far, I just ask that you like and subscribe, and don't hesitate to share it with a few friends. All right, so that's the basic picture. We're going to go from one species to another, capturing and emitting particles. Now notice, you don't have to capture something. In this case, where we're going from nitrogen-13 to carbon-13, we're not capturing anything because this is a beta decay. Beta particles are electrons and positrons. So in this reaction, nitrogen-13 is decaying into carbon-13 via the emission of a positron and a neutrino. Beta decays are always accompanied by neutrinos. And we have an additional information here of 10 minutes, and that's just the half-life of nitrogen-13. So let's just take a look at the cold CNO cycle for now, which are all the black arrows. There are four subcycles. And all four of these cycles involve at least one beta decay. So that means, for example, between nitrogen-13 and carbon-13, you have to wait around for your nitrogen-13 to decay into carbon-13. So the total rate of the CNO cycle will be limited by the beta decays. So if we take a look at this first cycle, if we start at carbon-12, we're going to go around this cycle, capturing four protons, and eventually emitting an alpha particle. So we've converted four protons into an alpha, and this is hydrogen fusion. When we combine all of these cycles together, it turns out that this interaction, the beta decay of oxygen-15 to nitrogen-15, is the bottleneck of the full cycle. So this interaction is ultimately what limits the CNO cycle rate. So why is it this interaction? This half-life is only 2 minutes. This one's 10. This one is 110. Why isn't this the bottleneck? Well, the reason is you can avoid this interaction. You don't have to go through fluorine-18. Likewise, you don't have to go through this beta decay either. So for example, if we're at nitrogen-14, we can move down, and we don't have to go left, which would take you back up to this beta decay. We can go right, and this beta decay is only one minute, as compared to this half-life of two minutes. Then when we get up to oxygen-17, well, we don't have to go through fluorine-18, where we're going to go through this half-life of 110 minutes. We can go back to nitrogen-14, and so you could, in principle, just go around this second cycle, and the longest half-life in this cycle is two minutes. 
but there is no way to avoid this beta decay without going through a longer beta decay. So that's why this interaction is the bottleneck of the entire cycle. So that's the basic idea. You have these four cycles. Each one of them results in converting four protons into an alpha particle, or a helium nucleus. And then you also have the hot CNO subcycles. So now, just for an exercise, as we did with the proton-proton chain, I want to set up a set of differential equations for the CNO cycle. But setting it up for the entire cycle, which would include four subcycles plus the hot CNO cycle, would be very long and tedious. So I'm just going to do it for cycle one. If you then on your own want to do the other cycles, it's exactly the same process. You just have to keep going. So since we're doing cycle one, we're just going to do this cycle here in black, and we're going to start with carbon-12. So the first interaction we're going to do is carbon-12 capturing a proton and emitting a photon and converting into nitrogen-13. And remember that we have the following general expression for a given nuclear reaction rate. So the time rate of change of some species x, which I'm calling x dot, is equal to some rate lambda, which is specific to the given nuclear reaction you're looking at, times the product of the abundance of the parent particles. So first thing we're doing here is we're capturing a proton. So this is going to destroy a proton. So p dot, time rate of change of a proton, or hydrogen, since we're destroying it, it's going to be negative, and it's going to be equal to some rate, which I'm calling lambda 12p, times the product of the two particles involved, while the two particles, or the two parent particles, are carbon-12 and hydrogen, or a proton. So that's why we have C12 and P here. At the exact same rate, carbon-12 is also destroyed, and at the same rate, nitrogen-13 is created. So the only difference here is we have a plus rather than a minus because we're creating nitrogen-13 as opposed to destroying a proton and carbon-12. We're also creating a photon, but I'm not going to keep track of that. The photon is the energy release, so that's a separate set of equations. We're just setting up equations for the number of the various nuclear species involved. If you wanted the energy output, it would be related to this, but you'd have to multiply by the energy released in each reaction. Okay, now we have nitrogen-13. Next step is a beta decay. So we're not capturing anything. We just have to wait around for nitrogen-13 to decay into carbon-13. So in this reaction, we're destroying a nitrogen-13. And the way we write this is as nitrogen-13, which is the parent particle, divided by tau-13 is what I'm calling it, where tau-13 is the average time you have to wait for nitrogen-13 to decay. 10 minutes is the half-life. And the average time you have to wait is related to the half-life by a factor of natural log of 2. This is going to create a positron and a neutrino. We're not going to keep track of those. So the only thing left is the creation of carbon-13 at the same rate. The next interaction, we're capturing a proton and converting it into nitrogen-14. So first thing is, we're destroying a carbon-13 at a rate which I'm calling lambda-13p. Again, it's minus because we're destroying, and the parent particles are carbon-13 and hydrogen. This is also going to destroy a proton at the same rate, and we're going to create a nitrogen-14 at the same rate. Next step, nitrogen-14 will convert into oxygen-15 via the capture of a proton. You should be getting the idea by now. We're destroying nitrogen-14, we're destroying a proton, and we're creating an oxygen-15. Now we have another beta decay, and this is going to convert oxygen-15 into nitrogen-15. So, first thing is, we destroy oxygen-15, and again, because this is a beta decay, we're just taking the rate to be the amount of oxygen-15 divided by the average decay time, and at the same rate, we're going to create nitrogen-15. And the final step is, nitrogen-15 is going to capture a proton, converting it to carbon-12, and emitting an alpha particle, a helium nucleus. So we can write down the destruction of a nitrogen-15, the destruction of a proton, the creation of carbon-12, and the creation of an alpha particle, otherwise called helium-4. And that's it. Now the process repeats. So the net process for this loop is, we've taken carbon-12 plus four protons and converted that into carbon-12 plus an alpha, plus two positrons, plus two neutrinos, and I wrote plus some gamma rays, 
but really I should just say plus some energy because photon number is not a conserved quantity, so it can be converted into other things. And actually, these positrons are also really just plus energy because they're going to immediately run into electrons. The two will annihilate into two photons. The neutrinos are just lost energy because they don't really interact with anything. They only interact through the weak force, and so they basically just stream through the star without knowing the star is even there, so they just amount to energy lost. And now if you wanted to, we could even get more accurate by including the hot CNO cycle. And that's it. That's the full set of equations for cycle one. If you wanted to do the whole CNO cycle, you just continue on with the same process for all of the other subcycles. As you can see, by the time you're done with the entire CNO cycle, this is going to be a very long set of differential equations. And you're not going to be able to solve them analytically. But we can do what we did with the proton-proton chain and simplify the equations a little bit by assuming that all of the catalysts, which is mainly carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, are all in equilibrium. So it means that their time rate of change equations all are equal to zero. Mind you, this will just be a first approximation to the solution. In reality, their numbers do change. Now you understand, at least qualitatively, how the CNO cycle works. And if you watched the previous video on the proton-proton chain, you now understand the basics of hydrogen fusion in general. The next nuclear burning stage is helium fusion, and we're going to go over that in the next video. So if you enjoyed this video and would like to see more, be sure to like and subscribe, and click the bell to be notified for the release of future videos. Thanks for watching.